She told me they went to Cabo, and he paid for the whole thing. Dude, she does his laundry and cooks. He proposed at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Bro, she plays in his fancy football league and knows more about the Cowboys than he does. She's got the husband, the house. She's got it all. What more could you ask for? Hey, what more could you ask for? Because she's got it all. No, I don't think that's how that song goes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, what's up, guys? All right, hello, friends in the room, friends in Fort Worth and Houston and in the Woodlands. Uh, we are so excited about what we're about to do tonight as we uh, finish up this series, Relationship Goals. But before we kick off this uh, Q&A of all the questions that you guys asked this week, we had questions coming from Houston on our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all across the board, emails and using the app. We also have provided a way for you to text in live questions tonight. Text in live, yeah, I know, get excited. Text in live questions tonight, and uh, we are gonna do our best to fly through as many of these questions as we can, um, not only from throughout the week, which we will prioritize the ones that have already been sent in, and then if we do not get to your question tonight, tomorrow at 11.30, Facebook, on Facebook, uh, on the porch Facebook page, we will do a Facebook Live at 11.30, yeah, <laughs> man, I love it. And uh, we will fly through as many questions for probably like 15 to 20 minutes as we can. And uh, if nothing else, JP will beatbox tomorrow at 11.30. You don't wanna miss it. It's gonna be amazing. It is gonna be amazing. I'm looking forward to it already. So uh, with that being said, we're gonna kick off tonight of a number of the different questions that came in throughout the weekend. If you wanna text in your questions, the number is on the screen, 469-759-3797. And Emily Corley, uh, a uh, crucial part of the young adult staff is going to be sending them to me throughout this night. Her husband is clapping on the front row. Gotta love that. Relationship goals. And, uh, and we will kick off as uh, we just explore these questions tonight. You ready? Hi, David. Hey, Jonathan Pecluda, everybody. I like your shirt. Jonathan Bob Pecluda. Thank you. That's question number one. Is your middle name really Bob, not Robert? It is not Robert or Bobby. It is just Bob. Uh, that's a fact. Um, all right, question number one. This may have been, man, I'm excited. This is going to be great. Yeah, let's go, dude. Come on. I got a Come hoodie on. on my shirt. I got yeah, everything. you do. I'm and pumped. buttons on the front, man. It's like, buttons on the it's front. It's like business in the, in the front, party in the back. Oh, dude, I like I'm, it's it, man. A, it's a little like warmer than I there. thought. But it's amazing. I'm, I'm ready to roll. All right, question number one is uh, maybe the most asked question that we got. And I feel like you, you fired this one up on people, so we need you to clarify it for them. Um, and it's all related to attraction and chemistry. Specifically, the question came in over and over again, how important is attraction in chemistry? Like if a guy asks me out, if I'm a girl, and he asks me out, and I'm not... Uh, Wait, hold on, let me, let me... Okay, David's a girl, got it. <laughs> and got he it. asks me out, and I'm not attracted to him at all. So if a guy asks you out... <laughs> So with that, or if you're a guy and uh, you, you're taking out a girl, it's a few dates in, man, the spark is just not there. Um, she meets all the criteria of, of like a godly girl, but you're like, man, I just don't know that I, I want to keep moving forward with this. Or um, another one was, hey, does physical attraction matter at all? Is it a deal breaker if you're not attracted? Okay. So a couple things. It, I think it depends on what you mean by chemistry. And, um, and if we're looping like chemistry and attraction all into the same bucket, here's what I would say. Uh, attraction attracts. That's what it does. It, it is, uh, I mean, God made, made us, uh, v you know, visual beings. And, um, and so I, I, there's no mystery that um, different people are attracted to different things. And, and you've got to understand where that attraction comes from. I think so often in our culture today, it's fed through pornography or through struggles or addictions. And that really informs what we're attracted to. We fed our heart something. Proverbs 4.23 um, just talks about guarding your heart for the wellspring of life. Specifically, it's saying that your heart chases after things. And so when you feed it a particular kinds of stuff, that's, that is, you're giving it, you're giving your heart like a bloodhound, a scent for something, and it's seeking that. A lot of times what your heart is seeking is what's not good for you because that's what you fed your heart. And so am I saying that you should find the ugliest person that you can hardly even stand to look at and be a martyr for the rest of your life and marry them? No, I mean, a a absolutely not. But here's what I would say, and I want you to hear this because I'm often, I don't want this to be misunderstanding. Uh, if they're a godly person and you're not attracted to them, that may be your 
maturity issue. Uh, God says that he does not look at the things that man looks at. He examines the heart. And so as you are on a sanctification process, you are not yet attracted to what God is attracted to. Now, if you say, well, what if they're just a stick in the mud? What if they're boring? Then I would say, well, maybe they're not, you know, uh, as godly as you think they are. Because godly people aren't boring. You know, godly people are some of the most fun people on the planet. I mean, they understand why we're here. And so all of those things, I think, play a role into it. Is physical attraction important? Physical attraction attracts and then it stops. Uh, charm is deceitful. Beauty is fleeting, Proverbs 31, 30 says. And so it is fleeting. And so if you invest on physical attraction, you need to know you are investing in a depreciating asset. You are buying something that is diminishing. And people don't think that way. We often say that physical attraction is ultimate. That's what's most important. And I would tell you it is the fastest fleeting thing. It is, uh, you know, I always say, like I said during the series, are you attracted to an 80-year-old? Well, by the grace of God, I hope your spouse will one day be 80, and you need to be committed to them. Um, you need to be able to cherish them, and that goes way far beyond physical attraction. That's great. Um, okay, so this next question is related to just doubts. A lot of uh, people ask the same form of the same question, which is, hey, what if I'm dating someone, and, um, and I'm just... I having doubts about the relationship moving forward, is that a deal breaker? In other words, I, I think they've heard this idea of, hey, when you know, you know. Yeah. And so if I don't know, then I guess I know that I don't know, and so I should break up. Yeah. Uh, is that true? Or is that a, um, you know, speak to that idea. Man, let me say this up front. And it, and it just is, I think it's important for every question. My hunch is it's important for every question we're going to be asked tonight. Friends, I want you to hear me. And, and I want you to test this too. And don't take my word for it. See if, see if this is true. And I, I don't mean to discourage you with this. I mean to kind of hit reset on your life a little bit. I believe we are so far from where we should be. I don't think we're close. I don't think we're barely missing this deal. There are a few things in our culture today that are so far from biblical values and biblical ideals. So what you're going to hear a lot of is, you know, the scripture says, the Bible says, we're not just pulling out this old book that's, you know, thousands of years old and dusting it off and saying, oh, here, here's your best, take some relationship advice from this. We're saying, hey, we believe that the creator of the universe gave us a handbook to understanding the most important relationship there is. And when we get that in place, all these other things begin uh, to fall in place too. And so I think that's, that is, uh, that's what's most important. So to, back to your question, I would say it depends on what you mean by doubt. Do, doubt marks your, do doubts mark your life? Are you a person who is kind of paralysis by analysis all the time? Are you questioning every decision you make? Because if that's the case, you may have a bigger problem that you need to recover from, pursue recovery in, before you jump into a dating relationship. Uh, because at the end of the day, this dating relationship, I hope, leads to a decision. That decision is a commitment. It's actually a covenant. It is a one-sided commitment. It is I will regardless of what you do. That's the covenant of marriage. Whether you cheat on me, whether you leave me, whatever you do, right? I am committed to you regardless. That's really what you're saying at marriage. It is a covenant. It is, it is uh, you know, uh, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. If we go on the honeymoon, and on the way back from the honeymoon, you get in a car accident, and you slide 300 yards on your face, and you're completely dismembered. And I have to change your diaper for the rest of my life and, and feed you mashed potatoes until I leave this place. I'm in. But my hunch is nobody thought about that. Nobody thought, yeah, that's probably the story that's going to happen to me. The good news is it probably isn't. But if it is, that's what you're signing up for. You need to be aware of that. That flies in the face of what culture says when it just says, hey, you need to be happy. And so if you're questioning, it depends on why you're questioning. Are you questioning because of their level of commitment to Christ? Or are you questioning, am I actually attracted to them? I think it depends on the why. And this is something that, you know, another reason why community is so important. Yeah. They can flesh out those individual things. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to skip the next one because it's how do I know if they're the one, which essentially is answered by that previous one. But to your point on, hey, are you doubting for the wrong reasons? A lot of times we doubt because we're like, are they pretty enough? Do they like the things that I like? Can she cook well enough? Is, does he make enough money? We doubt for the wrong reasons. And then we, um, uh, the things that we uh, 
should be focusing on, their relationship with Christ, or those are the reasons why you should doubt, if that makes sense. In other words, if they're not committed, if they're not a part of a church, if they're not all in with Jesus, if he's not the focus and priority of your life, you should doubt and break up tonight. If you're concerned because you like the Cowboys and you don't think that she's on board with that, that's just a, that's a bad reason to doubt the relationship. It may be like an idol in your life, but if you're gonna break up, it's the, the essentials that scripture lays out that are great reasons to break up and to doubt your relationship. Yeah, I mean, yes. And let's take the one, if you don't mind. Yeah, go. Um, I, you know, I've said this before. I, I will probably say this every year, maybe twice a year. I always say, you know, is there someone out there better suited for Monica than I? And so if you don't know Monica, my wife, we just celebrated 12 years of marriage last weekend. So we've been married for 12 years. Thank you, guys. Um, and so she, so I'm six feet, seven inches tall. That, that's, in the, that's in the weird tall category. Hey, like it that's, is weird tall, people. Yeah, he is tall. humongous. Everyone's people call like, David the short guy. They're like, man, like, the oh, short, guy. short guy. I'm like, dude, I am six feet tall. You <laughs> shut your mouth. <laughs> I say hey, it a lot more lovingly But you're not than bitter? That. It's cool. <laughs> no, man. I'm, I love them. I'm... And so I'm 6'7". She's 5'3". Um, you know, I, I am um, harsh. I'm a, I'm a prophet, meaning I, I, I'm a truth teller. I kind of cut to the chase. She's the most, like, loving, gentle, patient person you'll ever meet in your life. We are very different in every way. And so there are, a th- I bet you on a compatibility test, there are probably hundreds of thousands of men more compatible with Monica than I. And so the reality of it is, is two sinners are incompatible. When two sinners come together, two human beings, there, there's no compatibility between human beings. It is a regular, hey, we are committed to each other. We're going to be sanctified through this process. And I don't mean to paint it like it's all work, because as incompatible as Monica and I are, we have so much fun in marriage. I mean, the past 12 years, 11 of them at least, have been an absolute blast. The, the first one, uh, really year two, we really struggled. And, and then God's grace overwhelmed our marriage through community. And it's been up and to the right ever since. And so uh, just, just forget this idea. You're not looking for the one, okay? You're not looking for the one. You're looking for someone who and fill in the blank. And friends, you got to fill in the blank. And you got to be really honest with, you, with yourselves, and so just be on, like, go to your community group. Again, if you're not in community, we said it before, you probably shouldn't be dating, man. Dating is, is not for the faint at heart. You need to be in the context of other believers. They need to have insight into what you're doing and how you're treating the opposite sex. And so if you're like, if you're like hey, I'm looking for someone who has big boobs, cool, tell them that so that they can speak truth into that lie. When I say cool, I don't mean that's okay. I mean you need to be that honest, Okay, if that's on the list, then put that on the list, right? But what I would tell you, and, and what we've said over and over through, the, through this relationship, is you're looking for someone who is fully committed to Christ, who you can double the strength of your ministry with, that you can, you can go to war with these folks, that you can change the world with these folks. And you, you look at them, you lock arms, you say, okay, let's go. Let's run hard and fast. If you're looking for someone who is a doctor, okay, you need to say that. You say that to your girls, all right, say that to the girls that you're running with and, and let them speak truth in that and say, hey, we think you've added a criteria that is extra biblical. <laughs> you know, that, that is not in the scripture. So I, I think feeling it, you're not looking for the one, you're looking for someone who, blank, and you need to fill in the blank. And what I would encourage you to fill in the blank with is running reckless, with reckless abandonment towards Christ. Love it. Uh, here's one that we just got, we've gotten texted in a ton apparently, which is, does age matter in dating? What would the Bible say about someone, for example, a 26-year-old dating a 46-year-old? Oh, you're talking about like age gap. Yeah, age gap. Yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, we obey the laws of the land, and so um, there, there are some scriptures there. Um, but I look out there, I see Shane B. I mean, you're like 42 years older than your wife, right? Isn't that right? <laughs> <laughs> just, he loves it when I'm you bring that kidding. up. He I'm loves just it. kidding. I'm just kidding. I that is not time. true. Uh, it's not true. It's not even close. It's not true. Uh, no, I, I don't think the, the, the scripture does not speak into age to the best of my awareness, awareness outside of the, the laws of our land. Um, but I will say date when you're ready to marry. And we've said that over and over. We date for marriage. And so some people asked, you, you had said that some people asked. Um, uh, about college or about. Yeah, they were like, you know, you, you believe in early engagement. Um, or short, short dating, date for a short period of time, but what if you start dating in high school and start, you know, or college when you're not ready for marriage? Don't do that. that that's the quick answer there. That's foolish. 
I know that flies in the face of what culture's telling you, man. I know you've been dating since the fifth grade, but don't do, I mean, like, yeah, and, and just look backwards. Like, check, take a look in the rearview mirror for those of you who've been dating since the fifth grade and look at the carnage piled up on the side of the highway, all the broken relationships, all the hurts, all the heartaches, the sleepless nights, the crying yourself to sleep. I mean, why not just start dating when you can get married? I told you, I think it's God's ideal. I believe from the scriptures it's God's ideal that you do this once, that you would give your heart away one single time. I know that's crazy, but. it's good. Uh, all right. This is a very. Shane B. and Beth have an amazing marriage. I should tell you that. So way to go. Way to go, Shane. Um, is online dating okay? One in three couples today get married online. Uh, and specifically, can the porch start an online dating service? And so this is all like, this was all a ploy to roll this out. And so the porch is starting an online dating. No, yes, I'm we kidding. are. We're not, We're it's not really. Tinder with an E. Yeah. <laughs> Looking for your Tinder warrior. Tinder hearted. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Oh, that's so not true. It's, yeah. And not an endorsement for Tinder. Get off Tinder if you're on it. So Online uh, dating. Second Hezekiah really <laughs> speaks into this online dating. No, it doesn't. I'm kidding. Some of you are like, where is that in the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't speak. Yeah, believe it or not, the Bible doesn't mention online, online dating one time. It doesn't even talk about the internet. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I, here's what I would say, man. You're in dating, and, and this is what I want you to hear. Um, you're choosing your problems, right? You're choosing your problems. And so um, I, I like, I'm a big fan of the model of like you running together, you serving together, you observing each other as you serve at the porch and serve in church. And, you know, you're, you're constantly, you're going on international trips like through church. <laughs> Let me specify, through church. Not like, we try, we backpacked Europe together. No, but you're going and you're serving in the church together. You're constantly bumping up against the same person, seeing the same person. You've observed them. You know they're running hard after Christ. And then it's like, hey, let's spend the rest of our lives together. I'm a big fan of that model. I've seen that work really well. Um, you're trying to ensure who they are as you go and spend time with them in a dating uh, fashion. And I would just tell you, profiles lie. I can be anybody I want to be online, right? And I, I, so I can take a picture of David, for example, and say, here's who I am. And, and um, that's what I would do if I was single. And, uh, and, so, and so just be cautious. You're choosing your problems. The scripture says, you know, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. I'm not going to tell you you can't do it because the Bible doesn't say that you can't do it. But you need to be wise. I wouldn't do it in isolation. I'd make sure that your community is completely aware and, and not all uh, dating apps and sites are created equal, you know, so whether it's Tinder or eHarmony or whatever that is, just, just be wise where you're spending your time. And if you become addicted to it, like if you wake up and you can't wait to check to see if somebody swiped right or left or up or down, um, you just need to, be, you need to be wise. You probably got an addiction. You need to stop. You need to fast from that. You need to confess it and move towards Christ. Anything Man, you'd add, that's David? awesome. I think you hit it. I think, um, I think it's really good, especially the idea of not all dating sites are created equal. And so Tinder is uh, very different from... What dating site did you meet Callie on? Um, it was farmers only. And, uh, <laughs> I just love a farm girl, man. I, hey, man, nothing wrong uh, with that. <laughs> that is not true. Um, nothing against farmers only, and this is not an official endorsement for farmers only. Um, all right, I feel like we answered this one, but the next one was, hey, when should you get engaged? When should you get engaged? Yeah, I, I feel like we hit that, but in other words, uh, the amount of time. I think in one of the messages that uh, we did in the past few weeks, there was something like, man, date, and once you know that they are... Um, a godly spouse meet the biblical criteria, put a ring on it. Let's do this tonight. And so I think people were like, man, that is, feels really fast. And, uh, and so what is the appropriate amount of time to date before you get engaged? Let me shoot you real straight. I've been single, I've been dating, and I've been married, okay? Dating is the least fun of the three, okay? Single, hanging out with your boys, hanging out with your girls, seeing the world, spending time together, getting to know each other, living in community, fellowship at that level, man, that's a lot of fun. Uh, marriage, uh, running hard, doubling the strength of ministry, getting to raise kids together, getting to experience kind of the, the, all, all of the seasons that life throw at you uh, together, it's a lot of fun. Dating 
is the least fun of the three. And so I would do that as short as possible. And so you got to do that strategically, okay? And that means, man, I want to effectively and efficiently make sure this person is who I think they are. And as soon as I'm certain that they are completely, truly, madly, deeply in love with Jesus Christ, and I enjoy spending time with them, and I would get married, okay? And so some of you girls are like, man, I don't know if you noticed this, but it's not up to me. And, and, um, <laughs> and somebody emailed me the other day, and they were like, you know, my, my, um, my boyfriend, you know, he wants to date for like five years before we get married. Um, and, and, and so like, how do I gently uh, approach the topic? And so this is what I said. Okay, I'm just gonna let you in. I said, here's how I gently approach the topic. I no longer want to be dating you. Okay? Uh, this was fun, but you are no longer the one I'm interested in because you don't meet that. that. That's how I gently approach the topic. I mean that as lovingly as I possibly can. So, Felt like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I love it, man. I think it's really good. I, I think what you're doing there is you're telling the, the girl that, in other words, the idea of, hey, it's not really up to me is, is not true. It's not entirely true because uh, there's a level in which you could do exactly that. Oh, you want to date for five years. I'm no longer going to date you if that's the case. And so there is a level at which you can progress the relationship or be a part of, of moving it or moving yourself towards the direction of a relationship that will move towards marriage. Um, okay, so this one related to that. How do I know if I'm ready to date? Um, how do I know if I'm ready to be dating or marriage? Because they're kind of in the same season. I shouldn't date until I'm ready to be married. And so uh, how do I know that I'm ready to even date? So we say date for marriage. Um, I would read Ephesians 5, 1 Peter 3, Colossians 3. I'd read the Proverbs. And I would read all the verses in the scripture that have to do with marriage. And I would ask myself, man, am I ready for that? And um, then, you know, as I think back on that message we did with the suitcases on stage, baggage claim, um, I would ask, hey, is there, is there a sin struggle that marks me? Is there something, when I say sin struggle that marks me, um, I mean something that you are not currently working through. And by currently working through, I don't mean, man, I fall into it every single week. That's, that's, that's a sin, that's more than a sin struggle. Like that's an addiction. Like that's something that's owning your life right now. And so before you bring someone into that struggle, you need to get well. We have something here on Monday nights called Regeneration. Uh, we're doing a Regeneration conference this week. I'd strongly encourage, man, if, you, if you're like, uh, all the time I get these emails, man, I'm addicted to pornography. I don't know what to do, what do I do? You show up here Monday night for the next 12 months. That's what you do. That is your next step. You show up here. You say, you raise your hand. You say, hey, I'm addicted to porn. I need help. Okay? And, uh, and we, we will help you in that recovery process, but um, yeah. Community, I know you, we've talked about that a lot For too. Sure. Making sure you're like connected to a local church, don't date in isolation, just the danger of, of walking through that without having wise counselors involved. So that could be another, make sure you're in community before you start dating someone. Um, but I think it's great. Anything else you'd add? No, that's great. Love it. Um, all right, so this question came in in a number of different forms, but what does it look like to follow or submit in dating? What does it look like to lead well? In other words, the guy role, the um, woman following and submitting is clearly laid out in Scripture, just like it is for the husband as well, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, Ephesians says. So um, it's not just the um, wife's role, it's the husband's role as well, and all of us as believers in Christ. But you hear that often, like guys lead well, women follow and um, follow along, follow a godly leader who's leading in that direction. What does it look like to do that in dating? Should that even take place in dating? Yeah, and so um, that's, that's what? Ephesians 5, um, 1 Peter 3, talk about this idea of, of submitting to who? Women submit to who? Why, it actually says wives submit to who? Your husbands. Your husbands. I think that's really important. Wives, submit to your husbands, um, not to your boyfriends, not even to your fiancés, um, but to your husbands. And, and so women always think like, man, we got the short end of the stick of this deal. <laughs> Somebody's excited. That's good. Uh, and so he, here's what I would say, though. Here, here, get even more excited about this. 
I would tell you that the like tall drink of water, the tall order is actually on the man in those verses. Because it, before, it, when it talks about women, uh, wives submit to your husband, it says, husbands, love your wives as, as who? Christ. As Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her. And so when you find a man who's going to completely put your interest in front of his own and love you, lay down, compromise, sacrifice his life for your good, what's the only other appropriate response to that, right? And so if, you, if I would tell you, if, you have a, if you're having issues with submission, you're probably considering following the wrong leader. It may be you. It might be your issue. You may just have authority issues in general. You need to deal with that, okay? But if you're saying, if you're looking at a guy and you're like, man, I just don't think I can submit to this guy, it, it, he may not be worthy of you submitting to him in marriage. Um, it, it also talks about mutual submission. I do think that in, that in, in the marriage, um, that that's what the, the picture that's being painted there is that as a husband loves his wife and puts her interest in front of his, um, that she would follow him. Um, Jesus modeled this in Philippians 2, um, not, not considering equality with God, equality with the Father, something to be grasped. And they were not, there's a difference between roles and rank, okay? So Jesus and the Father play different roles, but they're equal in rank. Wives and husbands play different roles, but they're equal in rank. I think that's often lost uh, in our culture. And so here, here's the quick answer to the question. What does it look like to submit? What does it look like to lead? It looks like to follow Jesus. If you women, if you ladies are following hard after Christ, you're gonna crush this. Men, if you're following hard after Christ, you're gonna crush this. I have no concerns for you. You're gonna be a great leader. You're gonna be a great wife one day if you are following, if you are both following hard after Jesus. And I don't mean to sound like a broken record. It's just that important. It's awesome. Um, changing gears a little bit. Uh, this question came in and it's very much on the forefront of culture uh, and it was phrased like this why does God make people gay and how should we as Christians respond to gay relationships around us so I'm phrasing it that is a, a quote in case um, that, that's the exact quote no I better let you take this one no I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> nice uh, I'm kidding why does God make us people gay he doesn't um, except he's sovereign, and let's agree that's messy. And so let me just talk through this for a minute. And so if someone is uh, molested at, uh, in the fourth grade, and that causes them, causes them to question their sexual identity, and then they turn out uh, to be, uh, identify LGBT, um, did God make them gay? Right, and so we've got to we've got to consider those questions, and then and then we understand that uh, we live in a fallen world, and so along with he doesn't, I would say because Genesis three, so the world is fallen, and so people are born all kinds of ways, right? All kinds of ways, you know, um, with uh, I mean, and I'm not equating the two, and so I want to be careful uh, because in, in the sad thing is on a question like this, a lot of people lean in. And they're, and they're just waiting for you to say something that ticks them off. And I'm so put off by that because I love you. I, I, I love you. I'm, I'm glad you're here. You don't need to be so on edge. I'm not the enemy. God's not the enemy. He loves you. Listen, lean in. Okay. And so people are born with Down syndrome. We could say, why does, why do, why does God make people with trisomy 18, trisomy 13? Why do people die in the womb? Here's the reality. People are born all kinds of ways. Let me ask you this question. Why did God make me polyamorous? Why did God make me polygamous? Why did God make me in such a way that one woman would never satisfy me? Meaning that even though I'm happily married to a beautiful woman, I still sin in the way that I lust after other women. Why did God make me that way? Because there are parts of my, my life that are not fully yielded to his spirit. And God's ideal was lost in Genesis chapter 3 but he sent his son to die for those sins. And so I'm committed not to following my desires, but following the Holy Spirit in that area, even if it means celibacy for the rest of my life. I'm committed to identifying what is God's ideal, what is God's first desire, pre-Genesis 3 desire, and how do I recreate that in my own heart and life? I think that's the way that, that I would, would answer that question. That's awesome. 
Um, there's a message you did. Oh, thank if you, you for saying that. If you have more questions on this, and it's in our Lyrics and Lies series. If you haven't downloaded the Porch app, do that, or go to watermark.org backslash media. Lyrics and Lies series, I think it's called Same Love. So yes, yeah, Same Love, it's off Macklemore's Same Love. It's a response to Macklemore's Same Love. I didn't, if, if you identify as LGBTQ, I'd strong, or if you have a friend who does, I'd strongly encourage you to listen to that message, Same Love, in the Lyrics and Lies series. Also, Todd did one. You go to watermark.org, just search homosexuality. Um, it's an answer, uh, response, and an apology, I believe. Yeah. I'd, I'd encourage you to listen both, to that as well. Both are great. And then a response. How do we respond to gay relationships around us? Oh, man, it's a great question. I think it depends on if they're in the church or not, right? First Corinthians 5 Paul says, am I, am I now am I to, to judge those outside the church? But I judge those inside the church. And so if they, if they say, hey, I'm a Christ follower, but any struggle marks their lives, any sin marks their lives, like they identify as it doesn't have to be gay, it can be um, any sin, right? Then I'm going to speak truth to them and say, hey, I think that's different than what the Scripture says. But if they're not a follower of Jesus Christ, like they don't think the Bible is authoritative in their life, then I would share the gospel. I would say, hey, let me tell you that Christ loves you, that God is crazy about you, that he sent his son to die for you in the same way that he died for me. And so here's, what's, here's what a lot of people just heard. He just said gay was a sin. And so here's the deal. No, I didn't. The scripture did. Okay? That, that's, what, that's what the scripture says. It's not a unique sin. It's not a sin different than my sin. It's not a special sin. It doesn't have a special consequence. But it is not God's ideal in the garden. He created Adam and Eve, right? He created man and woman, male and female. He made the designs. He made their reproductive organs. He made them fit together the way they do so that they could produce life. And you just, that's not an old idea. It's not old-fashioned. It's not oppressive, Right? If you're here and those are your struggles, I love you. We've had people on staff who have struggled with homosexuality on staff here. We love them. We, we love you. Glad you're here. Glad you're listening. Love it. It's awesome. Um, all right. What if, I've, what if I am dating someone and we've had sex but are now pursuing purity and a godly relationship together? Is our relationship doomed because of sin? Man, I hope not. Um, I hope not, and it may be. Okay? I hope not because that's my story. Like, Monica and I definitely uh, slept together before we married. We weren't Christians when we, when we met. And um, just created a lot of, of disaster and collateral damage in our relationship that God had to work in. Then we trusted Christ, and then we were committed to celibacy until marriage. And that was hard, right? Because we had already crossed that line. And, um, and I would say my marriage is anything but doomed. Um, my marriage is in, in, our marriage is an incredible place and very hopeful, uh, trending well. Um, what are you doing? You're making me nervous. Um, and so, uh, Come on out, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what she said earlier. Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. That's so wrong. Um, keep going. And, and it, and it may be doomed if, um, <laughs> if you're not committed to, receiving forgiveness, if you're not committed to setting appropriate boundaries, like this, this is so important. Like if we feel so entitled to that alone time, like you're like, man, if I'm going to get to know someone, I got to be alone with them, right? That's, no, not necessarily, not at all. Not at all. You can, get to, you can get to know them in Starbucks. You can get to know them in bowling alleys. You can get to know them in, in public places. Um, and so if you've crossed those relational boundaries, um, you need to strengthen the boundaries, not because you're a legalist, but because J Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, if the eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If the hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He's saying, hey, you need to put appropriate boundaries in place. So, and then receive forgiveness. Christ died for that sin. You're not doomed at all. I mean, regardless, whether it's abortion, whether it's struggles we've talked about already tonight, you're, not, you're never doomed. Like the gospel is so full of hope, man. It talks about you being, becoming a new creation in Christ. It's, it says that he's no longer counting your sins against you. How awesome is that? It says in Romans 8, 1, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Condemnation, that word translates consequence. Okay, you have no eternal consequence for the sins that you've committed when you trust in Jesus. How awesome is that? Love it. Uh, here's one that came in. Uh, probably the second most asked question was related to um, 
dating someone who maintains a friendship or some sort of communication with an ex-girlfriend or with other girls or vice versa with an ex-boyfriend or with other boys. And so um, can men and women be just friends? Should they? Friendationships, question mark. That's deep, man. This is so, it's kind of bizarre, right? I mean, th there was a lot of questions there. A ton, man. It was, it was either one angry couple just like blowing it up, being like, <laughs> and honestly, it was not the healthiest form of the questions. Like, hey, I'm talking to my ex-girlfriend a lot, but my girlfriend, is, I think she's just insecure and jealous. Can you fix this for me? And um, some variation. It's of like that. somebody fighting for freedom and somebody fighting for us to help them. And yes, it's man, the other that one. Like, is so crazy. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, man, I can't even imagine like being in a relationship with Monica and, you know, having a relationship with an ex. Um, that, that sounds really unhealthy. I don't, you don't see that. Like in, uh, in the gospels, you don't see Jesus just like kicking it on a boat with Mary a lot. You know, that's not like they were just hanging out, just friends, you know, I, I, I think God made men and women to come together to attract. So let me say something crazy, as if I haven't already. <laughs> I think you could pretty much take any man and any woman, and if they were on a deserted island together, and that's it, like life will happen. You tracking with me? <laughs> like we could talk about compatible or incompatible. You're not, you're not tracking with me? Let me double click there for a second. Um... No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Bad joke. Keep going. You want diagrams? Yeah. <laughs> and so I, it, and so man and woman were meant to come together. Like you were not meant to just be like hanging out with the opposite sex and, and protecting your heart. You just wasn't meant for that. I know that flies in the face of culture. I get it. You can disagree. Feel complete and total freedom to disagree with me. But would you just consider it? And so, like, here's the deal. If you're texting your ex and your girlfriend's jealous, my, my, I don't know if she's jealous. She might just be wise. And, uh, and yeah. And um, here's what I would tell you. If you're texting anyone, like, late at night a lot uh, of the opposite sex, I would be careful because usually someone's heart is drifting, like God made us to come together and be in relationship together so that life would spring forth. This is his brilliant, genius design. And so he made us, he, he created these emotions in our heart that they would cross these lines and that they would go towards one another. And if you're like, well, that ain't happening for me, it's probably happening for them. And, and you may be a stumbling block. Just be careful in that, okay? And you're constantly playing that game. What, I wonder what he meant by that. I wonder what she meant by that. You know, that text at 11.30 p.m., right? I wonder what he meant by that. And he says, are you sleeping yet? I wonder what he meant by that. He meant, are you sleeping? But That's good. Uh, this one came in from online. Is masturbation a sin? Is masturbation a sin? That was a curveball. I wasn't ready for that. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I took that left turn, man. Um, yeah, let me, let me set up the arguments, the straw man arguments, because people will come and say, well, what if, well, lust is a sin. What if I can do it without lust? Let me say this. <laughs> you're not meant to do it without lust. Does that, does that mean, and what I mean by lust is you're not meant to do that devoid of the thought of the opposite sex. Like, that was never God's intention. Like, God's intention was his incredible design so that when you experience release that that you're actually fertilizing something and that life is being brought forth I know that's crazy let me say this even let me go even crazier because I need to say this in the series and I, I, I believe this like we think you think about what is the purpose of sex and when I say sex I mean the act sexual intercourse between a man and a woman what is the purpose of it there's two purposes of sex biblically speaking there's the bonding that happens, that is now scientifically proven that it happens, that when we experience orgasm, our five senses bond to our surroundings. And there's all kinds of uh, sexual dysfunction that's created out of this science that God tells us in Genesis 2, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And so sex, the first purpose is the purpose of bonding. The second purpose of sex is, the, is um, sexual intercourse is for procreation, 
that life would be born. This is God's genius design. Sex was God's idea. Make no mistake about it. It's not gross. It's not weird. It is God was the genius. He was the Steve Jobs behind the iPhone. He was the Steve Jobs behind sex. That, that was God. He said, I'm going to make those parts work the way they do. Okay? This one function the way it does. That one fits there. It's, it's, it's his. Don't think about it too long. It's his <laughs> genius design. I'm serious. And I'm not, I'm not just trying to like be you know, slap me funny right now. I, I'm just, it is genius that God, that is God's design. So think about what we do for a minute. What we try to do is we try to capture the act away from the purpose. We, you, you say, well, wait a minute, JP, there's a third reason, right? Pleasure. God made sex for pleasure. No, 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 no. The pleasure serves a purpose. That's the bonding agent, is the pleasure. That's like if, if sex felt like a spinal tap, um, I think that we would stop doing it and life would cease as we know it. And so God, because he wanted us to cover the earth, made it feel good and it serves the purpose of both procreation and the bonding. That's the genius of God's design, right? And so um, what we try to do is we try to capture the pleasure away from the purpose. Well, we don't, I don't want her to get pregnant. And I don't even really want to be stuck to them, if you will. I want to have a one-night stand without any recourse. Guess what? You can. It's theologically, physically, biologically, scientifically impossible to do that without any recourse. You can't. And so when you start think, say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to masturbate, but I'm just going to think Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you can't. You're bonding to Dr. Pepper. I would not do that. I wouldn't do it. It's, I would not do that. And so you say, well, well, support that scripturally. People have said all kinds of crazy things. Onan build his seed. Here's what I tell you. I think it's interesting, and, and just consider this. This is JP speaking. I'd step away from the pulpit if, if I was behind one. Just, just consider this. Let's put this in the opinion category. I think it's interesting that Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin regarding lust. I think it's interesting that he goes there. So you research that on your own, but um, he goes I, and then he goes hand, and I find that interesting. Matthew 5 is the reference. Love it. All right, we're going to do what's called the lightning round, and uh, I'm going to oh, wrap. we haven't been doing lightning round? <laughs> no, <laughs> one of us has. Um, I'm going to rapid fire some, uh, some questions at you, and then, uh, yeah, here we go. All right, should a single mother reconcile with her child's father even if they were never married? Mind blown. Uh, it depends on what you mean by reconcile. Like, like forgive, like make an amends. Yes, Get, be married because you have a child. No, I mean, it's great. Absolutely not. Like, like be reconciled. Like, get married just because you have a kid together. Be together. Stay together because we have a kid together. We have to stay together. No, uh, no. If you're, if there was no marriage, I don't think reconciliation plays a role necessarily yeah like community man make sure, there's a lot of individual case bases out there that i may not be aware of but i would make sure you have wise people around it doesn't you. rule them out as a spouse or rule them in that's right? exactly it's yeah. a great way to say it um okay lightning round well the, done the purpose the person i'm dating is a godly man but of a different race our families do not like this how do we honor our parents here break up um how do you honor your family i would say i'd say potentially you don't honor here's how you honor your parents is it sounds like they have a value that's different than what God values. And so you would go to them and you would say, if they're Christians, you would say, hey, help me understand this value biblically. And if they're not Christians, then I would share the gospel and I would go Genesis 2, 24, I believe. It is for this reason that I have to leave my father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. That's, that's assuming that they love Jesus. And so somebody asked me like this, hey, would you have a problem, you know, if Presley's, my daughter, that's my daughter, you know, married a, a black guy, would you care? And I'm like, absolutely. I mean, does he love Jesus? If he loves Jesus, absolutely not. I would not care. I would celebrate that. I wouldn't even consider it for a second. And so. it's great. Love it. So the way you honor your parents is go talk to them, either share the gospel or if they claim to be Christians, say, hey, this is, you're holding a non-biblical value. It's like, how do I honor my parents if they don't want me to go to church? Yeah. And, and I would just say, if you're, 
an adult, you honor them by saying, hey, this is what I need to do. I need to go to church. It's awesome. I need to be a part of Christ's body. Uh, if two people are pursuing God and in a dating relationship, but they disagree theologically, would they be considered unequally yoked? For example, they don't re agree regarding spiritual gifts or Calvinism, which is like a school of thought. <laughs> Calvinism. Woo! Thank you, our, our no, Calvinist no, section over okay. here. <laughs> <laughs> I would be cautious. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14, unequally yoked passage, talks about light and darkness, uh, good and evil. Um, I don't think it's talking about just like nuanced theological differences. If you're both running hard after Jesus, you believe in Christology, the gospel, the essence that we are saved by grace through faith, faith alone. Um, I don't think it matters if you are more in an Arminian camp, they're more in a Calvinist camp. But if, it, if you believe, hey, I'm saved by Jesus plus something else, that could be problematic. Love that it. is problematic. Okay. Christians and Catholics. I think it's the same answer. Oh, it's a great, that's a great question. Yeah, I would just say it depends on what you mean by Catholic. And um, if they're committed to grace through the sacraments, then that would be, and I, and I say this as a Catholic for 20-something years, uh, that would be Jesus plus something else. Um, you, you would need to lean into that and understand what that believes. A lot, of, a lot of people don't know what they believe. Protestant, Catholic doesn't even mean anything to them. It's like, hey, what do you believe about Jesus? How do you believe we're saved? How do you believe we're going to get to God? Hey, you're going to email me on that one because I know that always stirs up some anger. And, uh, and so you, you're welcome to. Um, or email David, D. <laughs> <Marlin>. <laughs> but um, but just, just consider what I'm saying. Gotquestions.org is a great resource, guys gotquestions.org. I strongly recommend it. It's awesome. Uh, can a girl ask out a guy? Sure. All right. Um, I mean, here, here's the deal. Remember, remember that whole choosing your problems thing? You're choosing your problems. And so if, if you, you ask out a guy, you're going to way increase your chances of getting a really passive guy that he didn't even have take the initiative to ask you out. Um, and and the other thing I would say, ladies, this doesn't get me voted most popular, but you may have a control issue if you want to, and you need to double check. Oh, there, see, there's the roar of the crowd. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Don't self-identify like that. Is what I said. So, no, test, test it, test it. Okay, hear me out. Just ask yourself, do I need to be in control? In Genesis 3, it says that... Um, her desire was for her husband, which we know that desire there is um, she desired to rule over her husband. And so, ladies, that is the struggle that was, was born in the fall and one that you will have to continually check for the rest of your life. That's awesome. Okay, three more. Uh, what are the ways that a woman can let it? This comes from Porch Instagram. Um, this is, what are the ways that a woman can let a man know she is interested? This question came in several different times by... Um, in several different mediums. Yeah, similar to the last one. I mean, you could say I'm interested. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I just, I'd be wise. I love it. Okay, this one, uh, Emily is saying, has come in uh, a ton tonight, and it came in a ton throughout the week, which is, is it okay for couples to spend the night together without having sex? Uh, cohabitation, we've talked about. So if that's not okay, what about just sleepovers, a guy staying over at a girl? That's, that was a question. And, um, and so and she sent it to me like three different times saying, make sure you hit the sleepover question. <laughs> Getting tons also hit the living together in that question. Yeah. Um, no, it's not okay if you stay with someone of the opposite sex. Um, with the intentions of not having sex, I would say you weren't meant to. Again, that's not God's design, and you're training yourself for something different. Like, I, I've had lots of cohabitation conversations. I just want to remind you the, the success rate of, of couples who cohabitate are 10 out of 100, uh, get married and stay married. 10 out of 100, you see wisdom in God's design. We love you, and he loves you, and so he gives you instruction. First Thessalonians 5 uh, talks about fleeing the appearance of evil. First Corinthians 6 talks about um, flee, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee sexual immorality. Um, for do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. You are not your own, you're bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. Um, and so that is the opposite of fleeing either one of those things. And so you say, well, it's just practical, like we're going to be in the same town, we've got to split a hotel room, we're going to save money. And it's like, listen, man, invest more in your relationship. 
Like if you got to cough up another hundred bucks for a hotel room, like I think it's worth it to flee those things and to have those healthy boundaries and to take somebody with you or whatever that is. Um, but but uh, you're not doing any of that if you stay together, you cohabitate, be it for one night or be it for one year under the same roof. That's just not wisdom. That's awesome. I'm going to group these two together and, okay. and finish here. And then if you want to close this out with closing thoughts. Um, and they're both related to um, what do I do now while I wait before the next relationship? And the first one is that came in a lot tonight and a lot during the week was how do I heal from a breakup? Um, what's the best way and, and what would scripture say or what are the steps that I should begin to take right now um, to begin to heal, to prepare for a future relationship and marriage that I hope to have? And in addition to that, beyond just those who are recently broken up, what is the best way to right now do while I'm waiting or um, while I prayerfully hope that God brings the right person along? Yeah, I'm going to stand up, okay? You, can, you do yeah. you, man. And... Um, and we'll just we'll end here. It's a great place to end. I, I think I can loop in all of those questions in one. Um, I've, I've told, showed you before, like if I had, had a Bible tonight, it's on my iPad, but if I had a Bible and I showed you everything is said about relationships, everything is said about dating and marriage and uh, male-female relationships, it'd be really thin. I mean, if you talk about a couple pages um, in light of a, a 66 books, a couple pages. And it's because that book... This instruction that Creator God gave us is about another relationship. And I know where you're at right now in this season of life. It feels like um, attention, attraction, and pursuit of the opposite sex seems ultimate. And I want you to know it's not. And, you, and you're going to know that I'm right. I can say that with, with all authority and credibility because every single person in this room is going to look back on this night, if you, if you don't right now, and you're going to realize, man, he was absolutely right. No one's ever come back and be like, man, you were wrong. It is, this was ultimate. Okay, no one's ever got to heaven and said, God, you know, why did you withhold marriage from me? Because heaven is all about another marriage. It's you to Jesus. And so your life, you know, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, first Corinthians six, Matthew chapter six, verse 33 says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. And it's in a chapter about worry and anxieties. He's saying, don't worry and be anxious about all of these things. Concern yourself fully with the pursuit of God's son, Jesus Christ, and God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who controls all things and loves you, will take care of the rest. And so I told you, man, last weekend, we celebrated 12 years of that, 12 years of pursuing Christ together. After three years, we dated for three years, just so there's no secrets here. We dated for three years. For three years, it was manic highs and manic lows. I love you. I hate you. I was unfaithful in those three years. I was a, I was a terrible person. I was addicted to pornography. I had sexual addiction. I was an alcoholic. And, and, and so there was so much to recover from. But when Christ came in my life and I, I went fully in with Jesus, seeking first his kingdom, he began to fix those things. And she and I began to pursue him together radically. And, and it fixed us. The Holy Spirit comes into our marriage and begins to repair the damage that I had caused. And it's been awesome. And so whether you're healing from a breakup and you're inviting community's help into that, because we bear one another's burdens, and I know that, that heart, the heartbreak hurts. Let me say this, okay? And we'll end with this. Band, if y'all want to come up, you're welcome to. Um, I've, got, I've got two little girls, seven and nine, if you, at any point between the past nine years have gone in the room, what you're going to see, I want you to know, it looks like Disney Princess has exploded, okay, in their room. I mean, on the walls, on their pajamas, there's dolls, there's, there's um, all kinds of figurines and books, everything around this idea of princess. It's been fed to them so Early on, my seven-year-old, we I was going to take her to a birthday party, and she had two friends in the back, and they knew every word to every Adele song that came on the radio. Bieber comes on the radio, they start singing, you know? And then uh, that, that Chainsmoker song, you know that song? You guys know that one? About the mattress and biting the tattoo on the shoulder and roommate in Boulder, that one. Um, <laughs> they start singing the words of that song, and I just, pa I just turned down the radio, I muted, I said, what's that about, fellow seven-year-olds? 
And they're like, oh, you know, I think, it, I, I think she's like in love with a boy. And, and then the Bieber is like, oh, I think that she's in love. And then the Adele, I think she wrote her boyfriend a letter and, and like she sent it to him, but she hopes he never gets it because, and, and I was just like, why are all these songs about love? And I just began to think about since they were seven year old, seven years old, they were fed this message. And men were fed a message too. It's that the prince is going to come in and slay the dragon and we're going to be conquerors. And ladies, honestly, we've been told by culture, we need to conquer you, which is really the opposite of what you want, right? You want someone to be gentle and caring and kind and compassionate and to lay their life down like Christ loved the church. And so guys, man, here's what I want you to know, and you got to hear me on this. And I'm, you just got to hear my heart. Your worldview, if it's anything outside of a biblical worldview, it's really, really messed up. It's really jacked up. And you got to take some time and create some space and get some believers in the room. And you got to pray, and I want you to beg God. Father in heaven, would you fix my heart? Would you fix my worldview? Would you remove the things in my heart and mind that have been fed to me by culture, that are setting me up for a divorce, for three marriages, for lots of heartbreak? And would you begin to inform me with the scriptures? Would you write the scriptures on my heart? Allow me to guard my heart, understanding that everything in my life flows from it. Would you, would you become the greatest obsession in my life, Jesus? Would you become more worthy than everything else, Jesus? Would you make me madly, truly, deeply in love? Take a strong man, a, a boat up, a you know, courageous individual and compromise him. <laughs> that he would be broken before the cross. And he's saying, God, I want you to lead my life. Take a woman who's terrified that a man's going to hurt her. And so she's hard and calloused and bowed up and is like, you ain't going to hurt me. And Jesus, break her. Bring her to the end of herself. Make something gentle there. Something sweet. Something kind. Something loving. And friends, imagine if he did that in Houston and Fort Worth and here in Dallas and all over the world. My prayer is that everyone here tonight would be married once and forever. How awesome is that for a lifetime? The truth is, all of you are going to get a divorce. And I don't mean specifically you, like you said on this side of the room, but, but statistically, that's what's going to happen. And the reason we do this is because we don't want that to happen. I want you to find a greater love in Jesus Christ. And it's absolutely possible. There has never, ever been a broken marriage between two people radically pursuing Christ. It's never happened in the history of history. It's never happened. So let me pray and we'll go to worship. Jesus, would you become our greatest obsession? Thank you for these questions. Thank you for the hearts of my friend. Thank you for David and just his wisdom and ability to ask things in a succinct way and thank you for the shames that you sing love songs through and all the incredible examples of marriage around us whether it's B and Beth or E and Kelly or David and Callie or Allie and Ryan or Chad and Emily and so forth and so on just so many incredible marriages around us Lord help us to learn instruct our hearts through your word and your Holy Spirit and those who have done this well. And Father, thank you that your word never returns void. Would you correct us tonight as we sing this song? Would you just change us? We love you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You guys, thanks for hanging in with us. I know we went long tonight. So amazing to worship. Uh, just the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'll say one thing just to clean up something I said as I was sitting there and just feel like the Lord brought this, put this on my heart. I, I think I said earlier that being gay is, is a sin. Being gay is not a sin. Acting out on any desire that is inconsistent with God's desire is a sin. And I'll say this too. Being identified by your sexuality, finding identity in anything, you know, be it 
a skin color or a sexual orientation or a neighborhood you live in, when you say, hey, this is the biggest thing about me, if I walked around and said I'm Kish or uh, I'm whatever, right? If I find identity in anything, first and foremost, beyond my relationship with Christ or other than my relationship with Christ, then I'm outside of God's first desire for my life. That's what I'm trying to say is that this whole idea is about another relationship. We're all going to realize that one day. And so, would you guys thank my friend David Marvin for filling the questions tonight? <laughs> hey, we had 300 questions that came in, over 300. We will answer as many of them as possible tomorrow during a Facebook Live session at 11.30. Make sure you check us out at facebook.com backslash supports Dallas, 11.30 tomorrow. A few things we want to make sure you guys know about tonight of opportunities that you don't want to miss out on. B, everything Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, if you are not in a community group, tonight is your night. If you're dating someone, you're in a relationship, you're single, wherever you are across the board, tonight is a chance for you to get involved in community. And if you're a guy, you can go right down this hallway into what we call open community group. If you're a girl, you can go right down this hallway, get involved in open community group. Tonight, we have a, a group of uh, friends and partners in this city. We are trying to reach this city that are going to be hanging out with us tonight in the lobby. We want you guys, if you don't have a place where you are serving and using your gifts and you're a Christian, to go stop by our friends and say, hey, how can I serve? What do you guys do to reach the city? They're gonna be here uh, to talk and meet with you. Also, voter registration is available out there. We believe that as Christians in a democracy, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to influence legislation and culture around us in a way that many in our world and many in history have not. But because we're in a democracy, we have Christians and we've been afforded an opportunity. We think that you need to take advantage of it. We think we have a responsibility as followers of Christ to do that. So if you're not registered to vote tonight, you can do that outside in the lobby. Also, if you're in college in the second floor in what we call stage two, which is just right up by the tree fort on the second floor, our college team is gonna be hanging out. You don't wanna miss, we're gonna be here uh, just gathering, connecting. And so come hang out with us there. Anything else that you remember? Anything else? I don't think remember? so. That's it. We're hey guys, if you if we can pray for you, if you want to talk to anybody, find somebody with a light bulb on their shirt. It says the porch. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, man.